We all rely on farmers and ranchers, but farming is riskier than other businesses out there. Crop insurance helps farmers manage their risk. With crop insurance, farmers put skin in the game by paying premiums and shouldering deductibles. That keeps taxpayers from having to pick up the whole bill every time disaster strikes. Today, about 90% of U.S. farmland is insured, providing $100 billion in protection to more than 130 different kinds of crops. It's a testament to the program's success. Thank you for joining us today for the Meet the Farm Hands video segment. I'm your host, Hannah Pagel, and today we are with Sarah Gallo with Bio. Sarah, thanks for joining us today. Hi, Hannah. Thanks so much. Great to be here. So to kick off the interview, let's just go back to the very beginning, take me back to your roots, and kind of explain how you made your way out to Washington, D.C. Sure. And I, this is actually one of my favorite questions that you always ask, because everyone's paths are always so different. And I think um, it really shows the diversity of people that work here in ag, but also hopefully gives people a good perspective of um, sort of where I'm from and, and how I got to be here, as you said. I actually grew up in rural Pennsylvania. Um, I grew up not on a farm family or, or working on a farm, but surrounded by um, other families that farmed, and that was a really important part of the community that I grew up in. I don't think I actually appreciated how much that shaped me um, until later in my life when I came here and started working on behalf of um, agriculture producers. But really, like my grounding was in you know my friend's dairy farm or some contract tomato fields that were outside of our neighborhood growing up, and um, really I think did help kind of put me on that path and help shape my passion around really supporting people that were feeding other people around the world. Um, so I went from growing up in Pennsylvania to school in Boston where um, I studied marine biology. There's not too many marine biologists that landed doing um, ag biotech, but I, I worked um, with a community-based fisheries group in Massachusetts after graduating from Boston University. And I think, again, that really just reinforced um, you know, just the importance of community and how much the people that are feeding the world and living in these small communities all over the United States um, really have some unique challenges. They have some unique opportunities, but they have amazing stories to tell. Their families are really deep and rich in history. You know, The communities they live on are so reliant on that production of food or fish or whatever you want to think about. Um, so I really just found a passion in wanting to help them tell their story. Um, I, Like I said, I didn't grow up on a farm, but I always made the joke that I would wear out endless pairs of high heels walking around Capitol Hill or anywhere else to help them get their story out and to really help um, highlight just what the important role they play in all of our lives. Um, so I was working in Massachusetts on Cape Cod, um, which is a lovely place to work in the summertime. Uh, as a single 25-year-old, not the most fun place to live in the dead of February when it gets dark at 4 <laughs> o'clock. Um, so I had the opportunity to come to D.C. and work for the National Farmers Union, and that was in 2007. So um, 14 years later now, officially, um, I'm still here doing that. So I've had a, a number of um, career jumps since NFU, uh, but that was really my hook into um, the D.C. world. Mm -hmm. So I kind of want to go back and talk about that m marine biology degree yeah. that you got, because you, you don't come across many people who have that degree. Um, but can you kind of explain, you know, what was the original dream or what made you want to pursue that degree? Yes, and I'm going to grossly date myself, and I hope that others will Google this as they're like listening to me <laughs> talk. But um, I, well, I've always had a passion for, I guess, animals or nature or uh, things like that. Um, but I watched the movie Free Willy when I was a child and saw the character working with a killer whale and I was like, oh, they made a movie about my life. That's me. <laughs> I am this person in Free Willy coming from Pennsylvania. Um, but really, what, e even as a child, just like that excitement, um, I knew I just wanted to study oceans and ecosystems and things like that. So. Um, there's a limited number of places where you go to school for that. Um, I think my parents would have probably preferred if I had gone somewhere warmer, like Hawaii. <laughs> but I went north and went to Boston and um, and just fell in love with being able to understand and had some really, uh, understand the oceans up there, but also had some really good professors that sort of encouraged us to think about the leap from science to advocacy. And I think whether you're doing marine biology or whether you're doing plant science, um, you know, there's there's a little bit of a hesitancy amongst some to really take that pure academic, scientific, um, 
work and move it into a policy space, but that just really fascinated me. So I think, you know, my nascent love of just animals and whales and those things that kids grow up loving really matured over time. And by the time I was graduating from BU, I had the scientific background, but I was really thinking more about, okay, so how do I use my understanding of what the ocean is really like, or how do I use my understanding of how fish repopulate? Um, how do I use my understanding of interactions between humans and ocean animals to really start thinking about policies that need to get put in place so that we see um, good science informing policy, mm -hmm. which weirdly enough is the uh, hallmark of bio. So I've kind of come full circle there. So I kind of do want to talk about your, you have a very diverse career path. I mean, you, you studied marine biology, then you came and worked for the National Farmers Union, then you went and took a stint with National Corn, CHS, and now you're here at Bio. So it's a very diverse portfolio. Yeah. Do you find that to be beneficial or was it kind of challenging you know, changing topic areas that you were working on? Yeah, I think um, because for most of that I was doing government affairs work, uh, the skill set that I had learned just being a lobbyist or, or being an advocate on behalf of growers, that was that's sort of the constant, I would say, across all of those things. And where there were some challenges was just learning the topic areas. And I think, um, you know, like many other people you've probably talked to that have bounced around the ag circle, those key skills around, um, you know, being able to tell your story or your member's story eff effectively, the importance of building relationships on the Hill in a bipartisan fashion, um, the importance of being to really uh, to really knowing and understanding what your members um, need and want from legislators. I think those are things that were pretty constant. And once I realized in my first or second job that I liked that and I thought I was good at it, um, the rest was a little less daunting. But I, but to your point, I've had a, a number of experiences, um, some left-leaning, some right-leaning, some commodity-specific, um, trade associations, companies. I've enjoyed all of them for different reasons. So when most people kind of think of an agriculture lobbyist, uh, I'm guessing a lot of people kind of think of somebody who's from the Midwest or maybe from the South. And so yeah. from somebody who is from the Northeast area of the United States, was it ever difficult kind of breaking into that crowd? Uh, I would say it was yes, uh, sometimes. Um, I think I, I was a bit of a novelty in some areas where I worked because I didn't grow up on a farm and because I wasn't from an I state or um, because I hadn't gone to you know a big Midwestern school and studied ag economics. Um, I, was a, I was a little bit different. Um, that has never bothered me personally, so I just sort of embraced it and was always happy to answer questions. I do think that there are some cultural issues for sure. Um, I am married to it now, ironically married to someone from Wisconsin, um, and I'm the only not Wisconsin person in our family. So um, there are some differences there too on a personal level that I think I've just learned to deal with um, through my work. Uh, but overall, I think more so my difference in thinking or maybe my different perspective or just my different kind of upbringing um, was always welcomed and helped sort of give a, a counter narrative to what I think was just, um, you know, a, a pretty constant uh, way of thinking. So I was often able to just interject and say, hey, well, did you ever think about this? Or we do grow corn in Pennsylvania, just not on the scale that you grow it in other places. Or, you know, New England, those some uh, farms in New England are probably the size of people's backyards in the Midwest. Um, but nonetheless, they're playing really important roles in the economies of those local towns. And it doesn't mean that the customers or consumers or value chains that exist there are any less important. They're just on a different scale. So I think um, just interjecting that concept of scale. But certainly my personality is a little bit different too. <laughs> no doubt. So what's something about lobbying or advocacy that you wish was kind of better understood in the industry? Yeah, I think, well, over time, I think that lobbying, generally speaking, and it's not because there haven't been bad examples, but I think just the concept of lobbying just seems really uncomfortable to some people. And, um, you know, the as I've spoken with different groups or been asked to help um, be a subject matter expert for different um, leadership academies or, or whatnot, um, a lot of times when I start talking about advocacy, the response that I get is like, oh, I just kind of thought lobbying was not for me because I'm uncomfortable or because it just seemed like such a huge, daunting, confusing task that people don't want to get into it. So I think one of the bigger misconceptions that has always bothered me because I think it prevents people from advocating for themselves is just it, that it's not accessible. 
And so I, I think one of the things I've always tried to do, whether it was telling growers or telling students or even telling my own family members, like you have you have the ability to go and tell your story. Like your member of Congress is responsible to you. And um, knowing your personal story and knowing how things affect uh, you know, people at home is really, really important. So I, th I hope that over time I've helped people become a little more comfortable um, going and accessing and being able to think that government isn't something that exists somewhere else and things happen to you. Like you really do have the ability to kind of shape the future and shape that narrative um, to the level that you're comfortable. Mm -hmm. So throughout your career, you know, what was uh, an issue that you worked on that you would say was your, probably your favorite? Oh gosh. <laughs> um, oh, that's hard. Uh, one of my favorite things, and it's very rare um, that we're talking about marine biology and farming and all of that, but over time and spanning a number of administrations and congresses, there's always been an uh, an intersection between ocean policy and agriculture policy, whether that was from agriculture lands and potential effects on uh, ocean ecosystems, or just the other way around when you think about things like aquaculture or ways that coastal communities needed the same sort of support as rural communities. That's always been one of my favorite things. Um, one, because in my gut, I'm still a fish person, um, and I like making those connections. Um, so I've had the opportunity uh, oftentimes to um, either listen and talk about ways that policies could support a broader set of people that are that are feeding um, feeding others and making their living that way, or just really the what is the intersection between fishing and farming, and how can we make sure that all those industries are supported? That's been one of my favorites. Yeah. Okay. Now, on the flip side of that, what yeah. would be probably your least favorite or one that was probably uh, the most challenging for you to work on? Tax policy is not my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, and very challenging and so I think when you working um, both on behalf of producers and then obviously at CHS um, on behalf of a he, you know very large farmer owned cooperative the tax issues are complicated um, and very personal um, but also just I extremely political at times so those were not my favorite things to work on. Who has been a mentor to you throughout your career? Yeah, so I think going back, um, I had this wonderful professor named Natalie Ward who taught me a lot about being a woman in science. And even though that was a long time ago, many words of wisdom that she gave me are still sort of with me around expectations for myself, um, around expectations of women in the industry, around the pressure that women sometimes put on themselves as opposed to their male counterparts in meetings or you know the ability to have results and perform. Um, so a lot of that has stuck with me. Since coming to DC, um, this is a dangerous exercise to name people, we were talking about this, uh, but I think there's a number of women that have made their career in agriculture that have really provided a, a lot of mentorship to me at times when I needed it or just times when I needed to see a friendly face somewhere um, or felt a little uncomfortable walking into a room where I didn't know anyone. Um, people certainly like Krista Hardin, Sharon Bomer, uh, Barb Glenn, um, Kathy and Wright have all been wonderful to me um, at various points in my career. And then there's a whole group of peers too. So th those are all um, women that were working here prior to me, but I think there's a good class of women, uh, many of which you've interviewed, that all now kind of have the same support network. We all had kids at the same time, so we're all balancing what it's like to work and have families and get married and do all those sort of real life things in addition to our jobs um, and have been a good support system for each other that way too. Mm -hmm. I think it's wonderful. I mean, I think for so long there's such this is a cliche, but such a male-dominated industry, even at the association or lobbying level. And as um, women have come and become a greater percentage of the people in the room or a greater percentage of the people leading organizations, Dana Brooks is another one, um, that you know we, we really are forming a good network of women that can support each other and identify opportunities for each other, which I also think is really important. How do you help bring in the younger generation into these positions, especially women? I think one of the, it, it's been unfortunate in the COVID era because the networking has kind of been a little awkward or clunky or we don't you know, see each other walking around the halls. Um, I do think that a lot of groups or companies have young producer programs. And I think those can be extremely beneficial and influential. Um, also seeing a lot more women, young women participate in those. Um, I think for a long time I saw young women participating because they were as a spouse 
um, I'm now seeing women participating as the primary, which I think is a welcomed change in my mind for sure. Um, so I think just the more other women can get in front of those groups and talk about, you know, you, you can do this as a mom or you can do this while also being a part of your community. Um, you know, there's not everything has to be to the extreme. You can find ways and time um, in order to, you know, either advocate at home or think about joining a board or, um, you know, thinking about coming to D.C. and making that big kind of scary leap from a small town to coming here and, and finding a community here that you can feel comfortable with and grow your career is really important. Mm -hmm. So it, it does kind of seem like when people come to D.C., they have this welcome to D.C. moment. Can you kind of share yeah. your moment with us? Yes. The first time I ever came to D.C. was um, when I was working for fisheries. and. I came as a part of a fly-in, and I got, I had never been here, not even as a child, I had never been here, um, and I got handed a packet, and they said, you're gonna be in charge of these talking points um, in these meetings, so just follow this other woman around and she'll tell you what building to go to, but when you get in there, you just introduce yourself and you say these things. And I remember thinking, oh God, like, I don't, I don't know how to do that, and clearly I'm not afraid to talk, but, um, but going from you know a really small kind of setting to the spotlight being on you is pretty daunting, and so you know you do take a breath, you go in the bathroom, you take a breath, you come back out, and I went. And by the third meeting, I was like, I think I actually sort of weirdly like this, um, and so I went back to the Cape and uh, and started kind of proactively looking for more opportunities. But literally, like handed a packet and told to go. So, baptism by fire, as they say, um, <laughs> but for me it worked, yeah. Awesome. So at this point we've talked a lot about your career and issues that you've worked on, so let's get to know Sarah on more of a personal level. Um, to start it off, yeah. tell me more about your family. Uh, so I, um, my husband is from Wisconsin, we met out here through uh, another friend of ours who was a, uh, my um, now sister-in-law, who was a lobbyist as well. Um, we got set up and it worked. Um, so we have been married uh, since 2012. We have two children. Um, I have a little girl who just turned seven who will be going into second grade. And I have a very spunky four-year-old little boy awesome. who's in preschool. Yes. So I can only imagine COVID was quite the time back home when you were working yes. from there. <laughs> uh, the first six months and everyone at Bio and the larger agricultural community can probably attest to this. Um, everyone knows every room of my home, my dog, my children, <laughs> pictures of my dog and my children. <laughs> uh, it, it's been a very, um, you know, like everyone else, it was just very uh, intrusive, quite frankly, um, to think about working and, and maintaining some level of professional <laughs> decorum throughout that, but I just had to kind of be humble about it um, and, and recognize that this is real life and everyone's going through it, but not without its challenges, um, certainly. Um, at one point we were in a staff meeting and I had to hang up because I heard my kids turning on the bathtub upstairs. <laughs> I wasn't really <laughs> quite sure what was going on, so it was a quick end to that call because the bathtub was running and I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Did you find out what they were doing? Yeah, they're, you know, very active, playing in the bathtub. Nothing bad, but yeah, lots of toys. Gotcha. <laughs> lots of toys up there. They're yeah. taking after their mother with marine yes. biology and all My that. kids love the water, so it's good. yeah. <laughs> so outside of work, uh, tell us uh, what are some of your hobbies that you enjoy doing or? Yeah. Um, so I love to cook. I. Uh, food was a huge part of my life growing up. I think most people that grow up in Italian households uh, consider like equate food to love and um, going back to when I was in college I remember the first time I ever called home to say I was um, homesick uh, which was a weird odd feeling for me because I'm pretty extroverted and never had felt that way before and I called my parents and I was like oh I'm just kind of homesick and my dad said are you hungry like he thought it was because I was hungry so I think food has always been sort of very center to my life and the way that I interact with people and the way that I interact with with my family um, so I cook a lot. Um, I cook a lot of Italian food. I try to cook other food as well, but I really do enjoy cooking quite a bit. So, so if you were to host uh, some people back home, you know, what would be a dish that you would prepare for them? Oh, that's a good question. I love to cook pasta and spaghetti sauce. I really do. I love a good cheese plate. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I think just normal Italian food would be my special, would be what I would cook for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is it made with homemade pasta then, I'm guessing, as well? Uh, yes, sometimes if I have time. <laughs> Motherhood also adjusts that quite a bit. Working and, and real life schedules also adjust that quite a bit. But yes, we do make our own pasta, raviolis, things like that. Yeah. Mm. Mm. That sounds like it would be a kid, kid favorite. Yes, for sure. My kids are good eaters. That's good. <laughs> um, so, you know, before we wrap up the interview, um, we always like to end the segment on this question. But if you could go back to day one of knowing everything that you know now, what advice mm. would you tell young Sarah? Mm, I would say be braver than than you are, and that don't um, don't be hesitant to try something because you don't think you fit all of the criteria that are on the paper. I think that's been one of the good lessons in life that I've learned, but I wish I learned sooner. Um, it's okay to not know every step, uh, five steps out, um, and that you can be a little braver, be a little bolder, and um, and don't stop yourself because you don't think you're gonna, you know, you necessarily check all the boxes on day one. That it's okay to learn and grow in a role, and that um, and that you'll be better for it at the end. So don't don't stop yourself short. Mm-hmm. Well, Sarah, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks so much.